In my previous video, I covered how naval guns were operated during the Age of Sail. In this video, we'll take a look at how pirates actually used them. One of my commenters asked me why I didn't go more into how the guns were actually used tactically in comparison to their media coverage. Well, media basically got everything wrong. The introduction of guns at sea was revolutionary. No longer were naval battles focused on infantry weapons and boarding combat, but long-range engagements between line formations. Ships of the line were massive. They carried large crews and rows upon rows of heavy guns. Ship killers. But contrary to popular belief, it was very hard to actually sink a ship. To sink a ship, you have to shoot holes in the hull below the waterline, allowing the water to enter the ship and pull her down. Aiming a gun below the waterline is a bit tricky, you don't see precisely where you're aiming. There would also be guys below deck, ready to plug the holes. If a ship got hit below the waterline, it was usually from stray shots. Line battles were simply about smashing the enemy's hull, rigging and crew, until they surrendered, retreated or were weak enough to be boarded. Cannons in the 17th century were primarily organized by their name, weight and the weight of the shot they fired. I'll present all of them in a table for you. They were the Cannon, Culverin, Saker, Minion, Falcon, Falconet, Rabinet and Base. This is why cannons at sea were called guns or great guns and not cannon, because cannon referred to a specific type of ordnance. Some of them were further divided into subtypes, like the demi cannon, which was lighter and fired a smaller shot. Same went for the demi culverin. Pirate ships were mostly armed with these smaller guns, allow me to mark them for you. So, just like Facebook boomers, they had a thing for minions. There had been other types as well, like the Dragon, Basilisk and Sirene, but in the mid-1600s, most militaries began to standardize their artillery. The archaic pieces were melted down and recast into the new calibers. This coincided with improved casting techniques that allowed for large-scale production of cheap iron guns. The best guns were made from bronze. In England, they were called brass. Their higher content of tin gave them a greenish color whereas bronze guns with more copper had a more reddish tint. Either way, bronze guns were very expensive and seldom seen aboard pirates and merchants. The gun barrels were pieces of artwork in and of themselves. They were usually cast with the royal arms of the nation and other symbols associated with the state. French artillery, as shown on screen, depicted a sun, fleur de lis and other such baroque ornaments. Much of England's artillery was produced in Sweden, famous for its mining industry. Swedish cannons have been found in the wreckage of the Queen Anne's Revenge. Cannons form a staple in pirate cinema and video games, but their importance is overplayed. Only the heaviest of cannons had ship killing capabilities and were only really found on rated warships. Because ship killers were heavy, equipping them would have slowed the ship down. Pirates and merchants had to be fast. Very few pirate ships were armed with heavy guns. The heaviest cannons mounted aboard the Royal Fortune, Bartholomew Roberts' ship, were four 12-pounders. Four. Most of his guns were eight to four-pounders. But what kind of damage could these light guns do? Well, a French filibuster in 1689 referred to the damage his guns did to the Spanish as throwing a biscuit. Most of the biggest pirate ships, which were rare in the first place, were about the size of the Duke, who was Roger's ship. A 320 ton frigate, she carried 36 guns, most of them 6 pounders. In battle against the Manila Galleon, it was estimated that she fired over 500 shots into her hull, none of them doing considerable damage. Again, throwing a biscuit. <laughs> In most cases, pirates and merchants wouldn't even need ship killers. The lighter guns were large enough to damage enemy crew and rigging, which was usually enough to make them surrender. Many pirates shunned cannons altogether, and had few or none at all. Muskets were cheaper, and much more flexible. Still, great guns had their place, usually as a tool of intimidation. A pirate ship looks much scarier with her sides pierced by gun ports, a black iron tendril sticking out of each one, ready to bark thunder at the lick of a flame. We're all familiar with the awesome broadside, an entire row of cannons firing all at once. This is an idiot move. The recall from so many guns firing all at once would have destabilized the ship. 
maybe even capsized her. It would also have damaged the ship itself. Instead, the guns were fired one at a time, each in turn. Oftentimes, the master gunner would go from cannon to cannon, making sure it was properly aimed, before giving the gun crew the good to go. The firing could be paced to keep up a constant fire. This was called a rolling broadside. It would have gone like tum, 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 not boom. Firing, loading and maneuvering the cannon was a fairly slow process, if you saw my last video. It was partially conscious. Fast firing could overheat the gun, which risked premature discharge. I'm sure there's a dirty joke in there somewhere. In the previously mentioned incident involving the Duke and Captain Rogers, the crew fired 50 broadsides in a space of 6 or 7 hours, so approximately one broadside every 7 or 8 minutes. Of course, Rogers' crew were an exception. He had dedicated time to drilling his crew in cannon drip, which most privateers may have avoided, being generally quite lazy. But the English were often better at reloading than the Spanish, let's say. In one engagement, English privateers fired 560 shots over 6.5 hours. The Spanish returning, but 110. Of course, the Spanish were known to be pretty decent in melee, and the French were experts with muskets. Again, if you need more context as to how these guns actually worked, and how methodical they were in their safety and management, uh, please check out my previous video. I also covered ammo types in that video, or well, I gave a general overview. Because next week, I will make a follow up to this one, and taking a deep dive into all the ammo. Because there's a lot to be said. If you're watching this in the future, the video might already be out, so feel free to go and take a look. But for the purposes of this video, I will give a quick rundown on the most popular ammo types, and how they related to tactics. One of the most perpetuated myths I see repeated on the internet is that pirates didn't use round shot or fire broadsides because it would destroy the enemy's cargo. Cargo was stored in the ship's hold, which is located below the waterline, and as I established previously, guns were rarely, if ever, aimed below the waterline. It was especially hard at close ranges, uh, most pirate battles occurred at speaking distance. So pirates didn't risk destroying cargo, and they didn't risk sinking ships. And they certainly used cannonballs, but in the period they were called round shot or bullet. Their purpose was quite obvious, smashing wood and sending clouds of large splinters to murder the enemy. A single bullet was only really fired at long distances. Most pirate battles occurred point blank, so they usually loaded two bullets at a time, or in combination with another type of shot, such as case or canister shot, which was a bag or casing containing improvised projectiles. Musket balls, glass, stones, scrap metal, whatever. This was really the favorite ammo type for pirates, due to how cheap it was. It wasn't only used for killing enemy crew, but was very effective against sails and rigging. Grape shot were several projectiles bound together on a wooden frame, essentially a sophisticated form of canister. Bar shot were two bullets merged with an iron bar, great at short distance for destroying infrastructure, woodwork, masts, sails and rigging. It wasn't only used against masts and rigging, as uh, some people like to say. Chain shot were two smaller bullets merged with a chain. It was worthless against the hull, and specifically designed against masts, sails and rigging. Again, uh, this was a quick summary of the ammo types, as I will cover them more next week. But really, pirates didn't seem picky with what they fired. They seemed to have blasted literally whatever they could get their grubby mitts on. Guns could also be deployed in other circumstances. When defending their ships, merchants would barricade themselves in fortified positions, closed quarters. These were kitted out with bulletproof bulwarks, and sometimes even cannons. These were set to fire along the length of the ship, and most likely loaded with canister. When pirates set up camps to careen their ships, they might build small fortifications and arm them with cannons. Joseph Bannister did this in 1686, and managed to fend off the Royal Navy. He didn't win, though, as some nerds like to say. They still sank his ship and he died like five minutes later. Though the buccaneers primarily fought on land, they weren't known for bringing their great guns with them. This would have slowed them down and needed land carriages to be moved in the terrain. However, Woods Rogers was documented as taking some guns from his ship, mounting them on field carriages and using them in battle. But they weren't so useful. But it was a fun attempt. 
cannons had other purposes than killing and destroying. Pirates would pretty much always loot cannons, even if they didn't need them at the time, or didn't have enough gunboats for them. They would dismount the pieces from the carriages, coat them with tar and tallow, and use them as ballast. Whenever they needed the guns, they would take them out and mount them. But sometimes, carriages weren't available. Let me read you a passage from the Journal of George Shelvock. We had one small cannon which we could not mount, and were therefore obliged to fire it as it lay along the deck. Guns were also used for signaling. Normally, different flags were used to communicate between ships in a fleet. But if a fog prevented them from doing so, they would fire a gun between certain intervals. Guns were also used for saluting, a greeting another ship, or a port they entered. When pirates saluted each other, they did so with loaded cannons. Kind of reckless, as they usually are. In 1686, the governor of New Providence Island kept a cannon outside of his house. Every Sunday when he held a sermon, he was also an independent preacher, he denounced it by firing his gun. When pirates arrived in White Man's Bay in Sierra Leone, they were greeted by John Ledstein, firing the gun outside of his home. As I mentioned before, cannons were great for intimidation. A merchant would use them as a deterrent to pirates, but he might want to cut costs. In this case, he could take wooden logs, cut them into the shape of pieces, paint them black like the Rolling Stones song, and mount them on carriages. These were called Quakers. Henry Morgan used them during the Battle of Maracaibo. He mounted a fireship with Quakers and wooden dummies, and sent it against the Armada de Barlavento. The Armada was destroyed, giving free reign to the buccaneers for the next few years. If you really wanted to mess with your enemy, you could sabotage their guns. The easiest way was to cloy or poison the gun, driving a nail into the touch hole, preventing the enemy from giving fire. This act of sabotage was cheap, easy, and hard to resolve. Henry Jennings did it to the Spanish defenses at the Florida salvage camp. To remove the nail, it was first smeared with oil. Then gunpowder was put in the chamber, ignited, and the nail blown out like a rocket. There existed other types of ordnance than the broadside guns. Chasers were long pieces mounted in the front and back of the ship. They were either used for firing at the hunter, or the hunted. It was believed that the longer barrel would provide better range and accuracy, which isn't true. However, as a consequence of casting methods, longer guns were stronger at the breech, allowing them to be loaded with a greater powder charge. This in turn did give them extra range and velocity. Mortars are sometimes seen in pirate video games like Assassin's Creed 4. However, the ones seen in this game are much, much too big. There were certain ships called bomb catches. These were armed with a single, large mortar, and used for bombarding coastal targets. Pirates never used them. The mortars used by pirates were called cohorn mortars, or simply cohorn. They were invented in 1701 by a Dutch engineer, Menno van Kohorn. This meant that it was only available to the pirates of the late Golden Age. We know that Woods Rogers had him aboard his ship, the Duke. One of his crewmen was wounded in a friendly fire accident, when the mortar shell exploded prematurely. The cohorn was light enough to be carried by a team of two. They were mobile, and could be loaded swiftly. They fired grenades or small shells, which were timed with a fuse. The fuse could be cut to reduce the explosion time. Cohorns could also be fixed horizontally, and fired like a normal cannon, but only at a very close distance. If a merchant ship was boarded, one dictionary from 1769 described how they could place a cohorn in their closed quarters, the fortified positions, and shoot canister at the borders. This is the only instance I've discovered of mortars ever being used in such a fashion, aside from the picture you're seeing on screen of a 17th century mortar being fixed horizontally. It's from a French gunner's manual called Le Travaux de Mars. The swivel gun was a small, mounted piece of artillery, as popular, if not more so, than the great gun. It was such a popular weapon among pirates that I simply don't have the time to discuss it in this video. Instead, it would get its own episode. And thanks again to everyone for helping me achieve 20,000 subscribers on YouTube. Cheers everyone. Huge thanks to my generous channel members and Patreon supporters. In particular, Cole Freer, Max Dweck, 1660, Michaela Jans, Daniel Stryker, Sea Dog, Randall Devere, Old Man Said, and Krillov. 
If you'd like to interact with me or fellow Pirate History enjoyers, please check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Hope to see you there. Cheers.